The gospel is simple. Your life, your circumstances, the decisions you need to make and the things you're facing right now may not be simple, but the gospel, the good news, the love of God is simple. And God put it on my heart to start something new. I'm a simple guy. Things have to be simple for me to get it, to really get it, to be able to do something with it. It has to be simple. The Bible's not always what you want to hear. It's raw. It's messy. It's uncensored. It's not always church appropriate. And at times it's flat out scandalous, but it's life changing. It's life altering. It's not boring. And it's simple. So I'm going to lock myself in a room. We're just going to dive in and see where it goes. Let's enjoy. Let's engage. Let's unpack the promise and love of God together. Let's keep it simple. I want to take you to Genesis chapter 30. If you got your Bibles, you can open them up. Or if your Bible's on your phone, you can open up to, or, you know, click it open to Genesis chapter 30. If you're driving and can't open anything up, that's okay. We're going to dive in together and I'm going to read here in a second, Genesis chapter 30, this first episode. I want to talk about micromanaging, manipulating God, undermining God. We manipulate and try to make things happen or make things happen in our timing instead of trust God. We all do it. And this story is about a really messed up family who just so happened to be Jesus' family. This is where he came from. This is his backstory. This is his lineage. These are the dysfunctional people that make up the 12 tribes of Israel. This is it. For all my people with messed up families, I hope this makes you feel better that Jesus comes from a messed up family and there's a bunch of messed up families in the Bible and this is a for real, legit, cray-cray story. But if you take a closer look, you're going to see it's your story. It's my story. It's our story. Don't judge. Don't crap talk because I'm going to show you that this story, it'll show you your heart and show us our heart so that we can heal and move forward. Before I start in verse 1 of Genesis 30, I want to give you a backstory. I want to give you a backstory. Uh, Jacob has gotten in a bunch of trouble. He screwed his brother Jacob's, his, Jacob's name means a deceiver, supplanter, manipulator. Uh, that was, he was kind of a, he's kind of a shade ball. Uh, he's kind of a shade ball. And so Jacob screwed his brother. So he has to flee his own hometown because his brother's going to kill him, Esau. So he goes to his uncle Laban's house. He gets to uncle Laban's house. He falls in love with a woman named Rachel. He loves Rachel, adores Rachel. And Rachel, he has to work for seven years for his uncle Laban to be able to marry his cousin Rachel. Don't ask. They did that stuff back then. Now you get locked up for that. I, I'm not going to explain. It was propagation, I guess. But the dude was in love with his cousin. And so Rachel, Rachel, um, he worked seven years, makes a deal, worked seven years for his uncle to be able to win Rachel's hand in marriage. Seven years, the Bible says, went by in no time because of how much he loved Rachel. Well, seven years happens. Uh, their big, big throwdown, big party. Throw down, party, everybody, he gets, to Jacob gets toasted, he gets drunk. Yes, I told you the Bible, it's very inappropriate. Uh, it is not church appropriate. Uh, I, I say that laughing because the Bible is our story. It's as raw and real because it relates to all of us and our craziness too. Jacob gets tore up, so tore up, he doesn't realize it, but they put Leah in the bed, uh, Rachel's sister, not Rachel. So Jacob wakes up and he done slept with Leah, and he's got to marry Leah, so he has to commit to more years of service to his uncle to be able to win also Rachel's hand in marriage. Yes, they had multiple wives back then. Like I said, got him in a lot of trouble too, so I can't really answer the question why, but I can tell you it got him in a lot of trouble. Uh, so Rachel, he works, he commits, so he gets to marry Rachel too. But here's the thing, it causes this feud, this competition it ruins the relationship between these two sisters. Rachel is loved by Jacob, but she wants to feel worthy of Jacob's love. She can't have him children. She's having infertility issues. And so she doesn't feel deserving of this adoration that Jacob has, and she's trying to earn it. Leah, however, is popping babies out left and right, but she isn't loved by Jacob. Jacob doesn't look at Leah like he looks at Rachel. And, and Leah's trying to earn his love. She wants to be seen. She wants to be cherished. She wants to be valued. Many of us do it with our parents and our exes and our currents, our spouses. 
our boyfriends, girlfriends. We want people to chase us and choose us. We want to be the center. We want to be affirmed. We want to be accepted. We want to be, we want to be, we want to be valued. We do that all the time and it gets us in trouble. And so that's kind of where we are. Rachel's got infertility. She's trying to feel worthy of all the love that Jacob has for her. Leah's trying to earn all the love that Jacob does not have for her. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. Let's kind of unpack this. Lord, I ask you, we're going to keep it simple. Just speak into our lives. We are engaging and you promised the word would not return void. And we believe the word works if we work it. And Lord, we're working it. We're engaging right now. Just speak in this teaching in Jesus name. Amen. Starting at verse one, starting at verse one, when Rachel saw that she wasn't having any children for Jacob, she became jealous of her sister because Leah's popping out, baby. She already popped out some. She pleaded with Jacob, give me children or I'll die. That's dramatic, ain't it? We don't just do that. We do that for our macaroni and cheese or when, we, or when we're hangry. But then, I mean, it's dramatic. And, and Jacob thought it was dramatic too because it says, then Jacob became furious with Rachel. Am I God, he asked. That's dramatic. I ain't, why, why are you blaming me? It ain't my fault. He's the one who has kept you from having children. This ain't my fault, Rachel. Then Rachel told him, take my maid. Go creeping. I'm giving you permission. I'm giving you a hall pass. Take my maid, Bill, huh? And sleep with her. She will bear children for me. And through her, I can have a family too. So I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there. I want to unpack this real quick before we continue. It literally translates, or there's another translation I like better. It says, go into her and she will uh, bear a child on my knees. Go into her. In other words, go, you know what that means. You know how babies are made. You've had the birds and the bees conversation. If you hadn't, you probably shouldn't be listening to this anyway. Um, she, he says, go into her and, and, and she will bear a child on my knees. Now, this phrase, bear a child on my knees, refers to an ancient practice of surrogate adoption. Okay, Some scholars believe that this phrase uh, refers to the symbolic placement of a child on the knees of one who adopts it. But my, others believe this, and this is probably what it is. It's probably literal, not figurative. Uh, is that the surrogate that, that refers to the surrogate sitting on the lap of the adoptive mother during both insemination and birth. So these words are probably literal, that the surrogate sat on the lap of the adoptive mother during both sex and birth. Bear a child on my knees. She was so desperate, she was willing to, to go through these Uh, go through this custom to be able to have a baby and to feel worthy instead of waiting on God to give her a baby. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees. She will give me what God isn't going to give me. And then I can feel like I'm your wife. Then I can feel worthy of the love you're giving me. So it says, we're going to pick back up in scripture. It says, so Rachel gave her servant Bilhah to Jacob as a wife and he slept with her. The dummy did what his wife said. Keep in mind, keep in mind, his granddaddy did the same thing, Abraham, and and caused a whole ton of friction and tension that's still going on all these thousands of years later. And so that's what happens. A lot of times dumb decisions are passed down uh, to uh, pass down generations. So this dummy is doing what his granddaddy did too. And so it says he does what his wife said, just like his granddaddy did what his grandmother Sarah said. And he slept with her. Bilhah became pregnant and presented him with a son. Rachel named him Dan. For she said, God has vindicated me. He has heard my request and given me a son. Then Bilhah uh, given me a son. So Dan's name in Hebrew, remember this, in scripture names mean a lot more than you think. They tell the story. Dan's name means judgment. Proof that God has heard me and judges me as the righteous one. He's my judgment. Dan is proof that God's loved me, that God loves me, that he's on my side. So proof. She's projecting. Shakespeare said it best. Some, I believe thou protest too much. She's projecting, protesting. And the proof, what, what it's really proven, Dan's name and what she's done 
to, to, make, to create a baby, to manipulate and micromanage and undermine God, what it's proof of is that she doesn't trust God. She's micromanaging him. So it says, we're going to continue further. It says, Rachel named him Dan. God has vindicated me. We picked back up. Then Bilhah became pregnant again. So apparently Jacob and her uh, went, to the high, went to the bedroom again. And she gave Jacob a second son. Rachel named him Naphtali. Now watch this. Watch this. For she said, I have struggled with my sister and I'm winning. Naphtali in Hebrew, the name Naphtali means wrestle. I have fought. I have won. We all want to win. We'll do anything we, we want to win. We want to get to the top. We want to be valued. We want to be, we want to be indispensable. We want to be the apple of our parents' eye, of our employer's eye, of our husband's eye. We want to be the center. I won. We want to win. We want to be successful, respected, revered. We want to feel worthy of the respect that people already give us, but we don't feel worthy of it. Just like Rachel didn't feel worthy of what of the love that Jacob gave her. And she named Naphtali. I have won, but she knew that she hadn't won. She wasn't even whole. Neither was Leah. Let's shift over to Leah because now we pick up in her story. We continue in scripture. It says, meanwhile, Leah realized that she wasn't getting pregnant anymore. Oh, Lord, Rachel's going to catch up with me. So she took her servant, her maid. Man, Jacob must have been busy trying to keep these girls, uh, trying to get in between them. She's, trying, he, he's in between them. So she took her servant, Zilpah. And gave her to Jacob as a wife. Soon Zilpah presented him with a son. Leah now has done had a son by a maid, by a servant. Leah named him Gad. For she said, how fortunate I am. Gad in Hebrew, keep in mind, names mean a lot. They tell a lot of the story. Gad means in Hebrew, troop. I'm a soldier. It means good fortune. I'm a soldier, I fight, I win. Just like sister, right? I'm a fighter, I'm not done yet. I'm gonna win this, I'm gonna win his love. Notice that they named their kids somehow related to the dysfunction because many times we end up passing down um, hurt instead of healing to our children. So they're right in the middle of this now. We get our kids in the middle of stuff all the time and their names are proof that they were in the middle of it. Gad, good fortune, I'm a fighter. I'm a soldier, I'm gonna win too. Soon, Zilpha permitted, they gave him another, uh, excuse me, and Leah, so we're going to continue. One son, uh, Zilpa, the servant gave, how fortunate I am. Then Zilpa, Zilpa gave Jacob, gave Jacob a, a second son, and Leah named him Asher. For she said, what joy is mine. Now the other women will celebrate me. They'll see me. I'll no longer be the one talked about that, man, this is a side chick. Rachel's the apple of his, her, of his eye. I'm going to be valued. They're going to celebrate me. Me. Asher in Hebrew means happy. I'm happy. How many times do we say that? Are you? Are you happy, Leah? Are you content? We do it all the time. We post on social media. I'm happy. I'm better than I've ever been. I'm, I don't care about what anybody thinks anymore. People post about their happy marriage and how much they love the person they're with and how they're an incredible husband or wife and they're just making stuff up because if everybody else can believe the lie, maybe they can. I'm happy. She's projecting and pretending and manipulating, trying to talk herself into believing she's happy. Are you really happy? I believe thou protest too much, Leah. And then the story continues to go sideways. To get crazier and more dysfunctional, I'm telling you, listen, because this is our story. It says, Reuben, excuse me, I'm going to, now the other women, I, I got ahead of myself. Now the other women will celebrate me. One day during the wheat harvest, Reuben found some mandrakes growing in a field and brought them to his mother. Now I want to tell you something about mandrakes. It was in Hebrew, they were called the love apple. So Israel, they, in, in that time, they believed that, that mandrakes or the love apple would increase fertility. There is no evidence of this scientifically, but either way, mandrakes were seen as fertility, as, as, ferti as, as a fertility fruit. So what happened is Reuben, a son of Leah, 
picked some mand mandrakes and brought them to his mother, Leah, right? So it says, Rachel begged Leah, please give me some of your mandrakes, right? She wants to have a baby because I, I thought she was winning and she had won, but now, you know, it wasn't enough because it's never enough and she wants to have a baby. She's back discontent, back just with the same place. Yeah, eventually when you're using drugs or ambition or a man or a woman or whatever to make you happy, you eventually got to have another fix because it won't fix you. Please give me the main drinks. Please. But Leah angrily, re angrily replied because, I mean, there's hatred among these sisters now. She replied, wasn't it enough that you stole my husband? Now you want to steal my son's mandrakes too? Like you, you get all the love from Jacob. I don't get no loving. What else do you, what do you want, Rachel? You see this pain? It's what hurting does. We project it. We pass it down. We, we just, we put it out there. We deal it out there to everybody. Rachel answered, Rachel answered, I will let Jacob sleep with you tonight if you give me some mandrakes. See, she wanted a baby. Leah wanted love. So, Rachel, I will let you trade sex for attention tonight and make yourself feel loved if you'll give me the mandrakes. <laughs> if you'll give me the mandrakes, I'll let him come sleep with you because I know you don't get as much loving as I do. Manipulation, pure manipulation. So that evening, as Jacob was coming home from the fields, Leah went out to meet him. You must come and sleep with me tonight. She said, I have paid for you with some mandrakes that my son found, that your son found, my son. Apparently, he didn't pay a lot of attention to his son. So that night he slept with Leah. And God answered Leah's prayers. I want you to, wasn't the mandrakes probably, but God gave Leah what she wanted, even though it, it, it wasn't going to fix her. It wasn't going to make her whole. He does that to us too. Sometimes he gives us what we're praying for to show us we're not ready for it. He gives us the husband or wife that we're trying to force and make it happen. He gives us a child even though we don't really need it or gives us the promotion or gives us whatever we're manipulating and undermining and trying to get and trying to force and getting ahead of God. He will give it to us to break us because he knows there's no other way. So he gives her a child. So that evening, Jacob, uh, excuse me, and, and we're going to pick up where we left off. Let me find it real quick. So that night he slept with Leah and God answered Leah's prayers. She became pregnant again and gave birth to a fifth son for Jacob. She named him Issachar. For she said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband as a wife. God has rewarded me. Now I'm having babies again. I'm going to earn his love. I'm going to earn his love. And Issachar means reward in Hebrew. God has blessed me. Has he? Has he or were you undermining and you did it for yourself, Leah? God's blessed me. This is my reward. This is proof. God's blessed me. God's blessed me. We put that on social media. Tell everybody, God says, bless him right now. He says, bless him, bless him, bless him. But really, you're not, you know that you're, you know that there's some things off in your life. We all, we all do. We all do. So I have paid. So, so had Issachar. Then Leah became pregnant again. Another one. And gave birth to a sixth son for Jacob. She named him Zebulun. For she said, God has given me a good reward. Now my husband will treat me with respect. For I've given him six sons. He will finally respect me and love me and see me. Surely now Zebulun means dwelling in Hebrew. He will come live with me. He will come to my house. I won't be the side chick. He's going to love me. He's going to want to live with me and build a life with me. Surely. Surely, surely, but that's not the way it works. That's just not the way it works. It will leave you empty and more thirsty and more hungry and more hurt. And the Bible says later, continues later, she gave birth to a daughter named her Dinah or Dina, however you would like to pronounce it. There is no symbolic and no significance to her name, Dina, because Leah finally, finally, was so burnt out that she just was like, I'm done. All these kids and then a daughter. And she's like, I'm just done. I've chased this man. I've wanted him to choose me to see how crazy I am about him. And I'm so burnt out and so broken because I put all my love and all my investment in the wrong places for the wrong reasons. And I am spiritually, emotionally, and mentally bankrupt. A lot of us are there too. But the story continues. Then God remembered Rachel's plight. 
and answered her prayers by enabling her to finally have children, the Bible says. He finally, he never forgot her. It's, it's just Rachel forgot that God would never forget her or, 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 or forsake her. She didn't wait. So she got ahead of God, but God never got, gave up on her. And he remembered her prayers and enabled her to have children. So she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And you might know the son. He's very popular in scripture. God has removed my disgrace, she said. And she named him Joseph. Joseph. You know much about the Bible. You know that Joseph went on to do great things. For she said, may the Lord add yet another son to my family. Joseph's name in Hebrew means may he add May he give me another son. See, one son wasn't enough. She finally had a baby, but she wanted another one because it's never enough. The success, the money, the respect, your parents saying they're proud of you, being right and proving them wrong, whatever you're chasing will never be enough. And she finally conquered and caught what she was chasing her whole life in marriage to her husband. She finally gave him what she thought would make her feel worthy and whole, and it didn't. And she named Joseph another. I need another hit. I need another drug. I need another goal. I need another something to give me purpose and to make me feel satisfied and complete. I need another. And she named her son. You notice these names, they pass this stuff down to their kids because we all do, not just by name. If we don't hurt, if we don't heal, we continue to hurt and we pass it down. And so later on in Genesis chapter 35, what happens is she gets pregnant again and she dies giving birth to that son. And as she dies, she names him Benani, which means son of my sorrow. She died. She, everything she wanted, she finally killed her because it kills our future and our peace and our life and our potential, trying, chasing everything, trying to search for significance in everything and everybody, but the very one person that can give it your creator. And this is the principle. This is the principle of the story. But what happens is, after all that manipulation, after all the tragedy, Jacob draws a line. He says, no, sir, I'm not going to name my son Ben and I. And he changed his name to Benjamin, which instead of son of my sorrow, means son of my right hand. We are not going to pass that down to our kid. We are not going to keep this trend and this pattern going. We are going to break this pattern, this generational pattern right now. We're going to start with his name. He's going to be Benjamin, not Ben and I. He's not going to be a tragedy. He's going to be a triumph. This is the story of the 12 tribes of Israel, the bloodline, the family of Jesus. And he had a messed up family. And the good news is no matter how messed up we are, no matter how messed up we've got, no matter how messed up our background is, the good news is God loves us and he never gives up on us. And that love changes things. It changes us. Eventually, Jacob would get past his manipulation and all his craziness, and he would wrestle with God, literally got wrestled with God and wouldn't let go until God blessed him. And he spent an entire night wrestling, and, and God changed his name to Israel. The nation of Israel was named after Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Israel means wrestler of God, that you can change what you're chasing or why you're chasing it. And you can start fighting for the right reasons and finding your fulfillment in the right places. That's the gospel. This is our story, y'all. We may not be chasing husbands, but we're, ch we're all chasing something. And we're going to realize the lie and the trick is it's chasing you. It's exhausting you. All the things you're chasing, what you want, what you want in life for the wrong reasons, I'm telling you, it catches up with you and it keeps you set back. And you're constantly, you can't get ahead. Two steps forward, four steps back, three steps back. We're constantly behind because we don't realize that it's chasing us. Whether it's money, you'll never have enough. And we end up, we end up passing that, that insecurity and disappointment and pain down to our kids. Not just by name, by identity. And the word works if you work it and want it. And we want it and we work it. I love the Bible. I grew up rough. And when I realized how rough the Bible is and how crazy the people in it are and that God never gave up on them and he never gives up on us, I just fell in love with the Bible. And I look forward to doing this again and to helping you love all of the Bible, the good, the bad, the messy, and everything in between because God loves you. And he's not given up on any of us and he's not done yet. The best is yet to come. So thank you for listening. Until next time, I can't wait to do it again. But until next time, keep 
it simple.